Bonjour tout le monde, mon nom est Michel Simard, je suis chercheur au Conseil national de recherche et j'ai le plaisir de présider cette deuxième séance du matin. Et notre premier invité, our keynote speaker this morning, our first keynote, will be Dr. Joël Pinault, uh, who is an associate professor and William Dawson scholar at McGill University, where she co-directs the Reasoning and Learning Lab. She is also She also leads the Facebook AI Research Lab in Montreal. I have a long, long list of accomplishments here. I will skip over a lot of them. I just want to mention that Dr. Pinot is uh, a senior fellow of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, SIFAR, and that um, she was also recently named a member of the College of New Scholars, Artists and Scientists by the Royal Society of Canada. So. Uh, Please uh, join me in welcoming Dr. Pinot. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be here with you today to discuss these uh, important topics. I think the presentation this morning um, launched several interesting threads for discussion. In my talk, I'm actually going to uh, try to um, bring some of this closer to some of the research that's happening in our research labs. The results I'm presenting today are all uh, work that is drawn from my activities at McGill Universities as well as with colleagues at University of Montreal. None of this is work that was actually done um, in our Facebook AI research lab, though I'm, I'm happy to comment about that work uh, separately during questions later on. The work that we do uh, in our uh, lab at uh, McGill is focused on developing AI systems for dialogue conversational agents. And so when we look at the framing of the problem, traditionally the question of building a dialogue systems has been achieved by developing several separate modules independently. So research groups would focus on speech recognition systems and speech synthesis system, maybe knowledge ontologies, response generation, tracking intent, so on and so forth. And in the last few years, there's really been a movement towards what we call end-to-end -end dialogue systems. This is the part that's in the red box over here, where we jointly together, usually through a neural network system, learn how the system is able to interpret the information coming to the, from the user, track relevant information, synthesize from this appropriate knowledge or response to communicate that, and then translate that into natural language which the user can understand. And so the work that I'll discuss today stems from systems we've built to do exactly this, those four components together in one large neural network. I'll give you a very brief flavor of the computational models that underlie these kinds of systems. I'm going to exclude many of the more recent work which we're building on um, including how to pour in external knowledge and user modeling and memory and so on and so forth just for the purposes of today. Um, there's several interesting technical challenges that arise out of this work. And I've actually been working in dialogue systems since the days of my um, PhD in the early 2000s. Um, but there's a reason the interest in these kinds of systems has really uh, grown significantly in recent years. And that's just the strong prevalence of opportunities on the business side for using AI-based conversational agents. Quick stat, which is already several months out of date, on the order of 100,000 chatbots operating on Facebook Messenger today. These are not Facebook designed chatbots. These chatbots are designed by other people around the world who feel that there is useful use of these uh, chatbots. Um, of course, they have access to the several um, users that are active on the platform. This is just one example amongst the many, many digital platforms through which humans interact today. And really the interest in dialogue systems stems from this immense potential to have one's life, in particular your digital life, be mediated through these conversational agents. Here's a very simple example from a data set what we're using in our research. This is a data set that is actually um, from a set of Twitter interactions. So user one says, am I out of jail yet testing? And user two responds, yeah, I posted bail. And the task for our AI system is to predict the next utterance in this system. I'm not going to ask you to do this. But I'm going to ask you to raise your hand if the answer you had in mind is this one. <laughs> okay, so probably not. So maybe some of you are being shy and you were um, very much 
seeing the next thing that's coming on. I use this example uh, for several reasons. Um, number one, from a technical point of view to illustrate the difficulty of the task. The data sets we have is one conversation thread. And yet the number of conversation threads that could spin out of this small context is probably as large as the number of people who attempt to respond it. In contrast to several other machine learning tasks that are very closed, we've all seen examples of image classification where we show you an example of an animal, we ask you is this a cat or a dog. In that case I can assure you that the level of agreement in the room would be much higher than for a task like this. So from a technical point of view, this is quite difficult to figure out how do we train systems when there's so many possible correct answers. At the same time, there's also a large number of answers that are not quite appropriate. So if this was a conversation with a work colleague, I'm not sure the answer provided here would be actually appropriate in a business context. And so really this notion of what's a right answer and what's a wrong answer gets very nuanced in the context of a dialogue systems, possibly more so than other applications of AI and machine learning. And yet, I remind you, hundreds of thousands of chatbots deployed already in systems. And so here's for the very brief taste of what we're doing. Those of you who are a little bit more technically inclined, we're building on a long literature using recurrent neural network, which track the state of the information. I'm not going to attempt a full tutorial on this today, really to point out that at the bottom of this graph, you have these little um, lines, you know, with white and dark boxes. You can think of this as a vector, a sequence of numbers. These sequences of numbers are representing the words that are spoken. And so the sequence of word is fed into this machine, this neural network. And out of this, on the top of it, those purple dots is essentially a representation of the information that's accumulated through the set of words. And so when we train a neural network, when we talk about training, what we mean is that we are learning the function that goes in this box A. You can think of that as a few lines of code or mathematical function. When you have a lot of data, you can learn a very complex mathematical function. So we train the neural network. It means learn a function in here that is able to predict the information coming in the words, and eventually learn a function that's able to predict a response. So as we move to dialogue system, the purple dots are actually going to lead to the words that are spoken in the response. This is the basic model that's been around for a couple decades. In some of our work, a lot of what we do in our lab in computer science is to build increasingly more sophisticated models to do this, in particular using different levels of information encoding, using ways to inject more variability in the space of response and so on and so forth. All the work that we do on the technical side is actually um, uh, open source. The models, the data sets are mostly all open sourced, accessible to everyone, and the papers are released either through uh, conference and journals or through uh, online platforms like archives. So if you're interested, all of this is um, available. We've been using this uh, system um, for several tasks and we've entered a few competitions. And the general approach we use is actually a combination of training many of these models. So I showed you two models, one very simple one, this recurrent neural network, a much more complex one, this VHRED model. And so we usually train a collection of all of these models on several different data sets. And then we use a mechanism called reinforcement learning to select at any time point in a conversation which of these models seems to be generating the most promising answers and to output that answer to the user. So the final system that we deploy Roughly what we think is state-of-the-art technology nowadays is to train a large collection of these unsupervised models and to use this RL mechanism which can be trained with significantly less data to achieve good performance. So we've used this approach to enter a bot into the Amazon Alexa Prize a couple of years ago. You may have heard about this. We used a similar approach um, at the NIPS Conversational Challenge. In this case, we deployed another bot, slightly modified, but not that different from the general lines of what I'm showing here. And because we want to get to the social and ethical implications of this work, let me show you a specific conversation that this bot had during the um, NIPS conversation. In this case, the task is to start from an initial very short news item. In this case, um, it's a little bit small for some of you, three successive bomb blasts in Baghdad, capital of Iraq, killed at least 11 people, according uh, to police. So that's the initial news clip 
And from that point on, the AI bot and a human user engage in a conversation to discuss the content of the article. And so the conversation goes on and so on and so on. And at the end, essentially, for those of you who, for whom it's a little bit small, at the end, they kind of move topics and end up with some kind of joke about this topic, really veering off topic in a way that's probably quite inappropriate given the grounding of the conversation. And so our, our reflection on, on observing the behavior of our bot in some cases was that we felt it was really quite inappropriate in how it was um, veering off in conversation. It had um, not really a good sense of what it was trying to achieve. And really several different challenges came up and really pushed us into exploring some of these social and ethical issues and how they arise. So sort of these competitions and the technical development for us was grounds for then developing um, more appreciation for um, some of the more complex issues surrounding the development of the model. So what I'll do in the last little part of the talk is really give you um, a bit of a flavor of the kind of problems that arise and in particular um, how uh, in some cases some aspirational goals that we have and I think some of the talks this morning proposed some really interesting aspirational goals, um, value by design and so privacy by design, I'm sorry, um, and how to do that in AI, and how do we confront that from the technical point of view. Um, and so let's start by the first, um, which is this question of value alignment. In many cases, what I mean by this is, how do we make sure that the behavior we're seeing in our system is um, consistent with the behavior that we value? How do we evaluate this? And so most of us are coming from a mathematical, computational point of view. Um, we like to have objectives, mathematical objectives. I'm not going to ask you to understand all these equations today, but essentially the most common objective that our model use is something we call um, the maximum log likelihood, and our machines are designed to maximize this particular quantity. And essentially that quantity means what's the probability of the next utterance. So the answer that I showed you, maximizing the probability of the actual sentence that's in the training set. This is great. The best part about this is one, it reflects the statistical properties of the data. And number two, it's differentiable, which means we can use it in a neural net. This is great for us. Um, it turns out that uh, it doesn't always correlate to um, outputs that humans judge to be very good. And so in response to this, people have come up with all sorts of other scores, a really popular one which comes from machine translation, something we call the blue score. Um, and in this case, the blue score essentially measures the number of words that overlap in little groups of two, three, four. And so if you think of the response you had in your head to the example I proposed, versus the answer that I showed you, you'd have to count like how many words were the same, how many single words, how many pairs of words, triples of words were the same, and you take that together and you get your blue score. Um, blue score collates a little bit better to human assessment in machine translation tasks. Not so much in dialogue systems. So what I'm showing you on the left is if I ask two humans to assess the quality of a response, two humans, they agree. Um, if we ask the human how good was the response versus the blue score, what you're seeing on the right, if you're not used to interpreting these kinds of graphs, there is no correlation there. Um, and so what I'm trying to uh, communicate with you as a message today is this notion of how do we take our notion of what's a good behavior for a system, and then how do we translate that in a language and a criteria that the computer and the algorithms can use is often not an easy task. And this is not for lack of trying. We've been talking to linguists about this for several years, and there are many, many systems that have been developed, and yet we still use these really primitive scoring methods like the blue score. In some cases, in the case of likelihood, we use them because they're convenient from a mathematical perspective. I pointed out the fact that it's differentiable. The blue score isn't differentiable, um, but in fact, at least it has been uh, shown in translation case to correlate with human judgment. And in dialogue system, people have been using it for several years, thinking translation is a little bit like conversation. In both cases, you're outputting sentences, um, but it turns out that it's really very, very poorly correlated with human judgments. <laughs> 
uh, in some of our work, we actually went to building a scoring system that was able to better reflect human judgment. So we said if we have human judgments, we had generated human judgments to um, show that there was not a good correlation to blue. So we used this data to train a new system that could actually predict the human score. But what we were predicting is some vague quantity. We asked people, you know, how appropriate is the response overall? And that's a really vague measure of the value. We tried much more specific questions. We had long discussions in the lab about whether we should ask about how coherent it is and how pertinent and on topic and all these other ones. And for all these other questions, actually, we got very poor correlations human to human. So if humans don't agree on the question, certainly we're not going to train a machine to understand what humans mean about it. The only question on which we get yet humans to get correlation is this really vague one. So we trained our machine. We were able to show that our correlation number in this case, higher is better. So we had much higher correlation than the blue score. This was very satisfying. Um, and yet, and yet, this notion of how appropriate is the response overall is such a crude notion compared to what we want to have in terms of property of our AI systems. And certainly in the talks this morning, we've discussed much more sophisticated properties that we'd like to achieve and that we aspire to. And so um, I will talk about a few of these other properties and how they are exhibited in dialogue systems. Um, let me start with this notion of bias, which already we've discussed today. The notion that the system may exhibit discriminatory behavior towards one group versus another. The main sources of bias in dialogue systems depend on the nature of the dialogue system. And so when I mentioned earlier on that there was on the order and probably much beyond 100,000 chatbots, um, many of them fall under the first category. They're more rule-based systems. So someone has written out, if you hear about this kind of topic, your system should give this kind of answer. So someone really on the level of these classical expert systems that we had developed in the 1980s built these chatbots. So in those cases, a lot of the bias is introduced by the person designing the rules. As we're moving towards the second category of dialogue systems, these data-driven trained dialogue system, which is the area where we do most of our work, um, the bias is much more introduced in the data. Uh, that can be the data sets itself, but it can also be the choice of data set, the collection procedure, as well as how the labeling was done. And I explained how we do our labeling at a very crude level here. Um, there's been some nice uh, work that looks at how we can unbias the very representation of the words that are fed into the dialogue system. So when I showed you my recurrent neural network, I drew your attention to the vectors at the bottom of the system. These vectors are a numerical representation of each word, and there's been um, good evidence showing that the very representation in these vectors is actually quite biased. So once you feed that information through the dialogue system, of course you're not going to necessarily clean up your act through the learning. So some people have proposed methods to take these word embeddings and unbias them. And so let me show you a very simple example of what happens when you do this. I've given you just one sentence, so think of this as the beginning of a sentence. She is a footballer. And once again, your task is going to be to think of how to complete that sentence. Rather unusual start. Um, you may see that I'm using that example because in many cases, footballers are actually male rather than female. So it's a nice little test for a system. If we use the standard vector representation that don't have the debiasing, the completion is, but we have no ambition for him. And so clearly the system hangs on to the word footballer and decides must be a gender uh, that matches the male and um, does not respect the early parts of the sentence for lack of training data. If we use the unbiased uh, word embeddings, we get something much more interesting. Um, she's a footballer, but I was undergoing a drop in the silver possible to Zulu season. <laughs> huh. Interesting. So um, the, the good news is you don't necessarily see a change of gender to our footballer. That seems good uh, from that point of view. Um, unfortunately, uh, the, the meaning of the sentence is like completely changed. I'm not even quite sure what this one is. And so uh, I, I think this example is a, a, a fair representation of where we're at from a technical point of view. And so I just want to perhaps offer a counterpoint to some of the discussions earlier this morning that argued that we're not in a zero uh, 
some game with respect to, to, to privacy, in this case I mean with value. I I'm very much think we should embrace this notion that we want to aim for a positive sum game. But, but I also want to caution that on the technical level, in many cases, when you start using techniques that reduce bias, when you start using techniques that increase safety, and I'll have another example on this, when you start using techniques that tackle some of these ethical dimensions, in the current state of the technology, what we often see is a clear impact on performance. And we haven't yet found at the technical level ways to tackle this successfully. But it's on our radar. We're working on it. Um, a quick note about uh, the prevalence of hate and offensive speech in these kinds of data sets. Uh, the example I showed you earlier was a Twitter data set. Uh, we, use with open, we use open source public data sets. We have other data sets that come from Reddit, some politics forum, um, some movie corpuses, an Ubuntu, very technical dialogue corpus. And what you see is the prevalence of hate speech varies a lot from one corpus to another. The prevalence of offensive language also varies a lot. I would say that of all of these topics, politics is by far the worst on both of these accounts. Um, so beware what you read. Um, but what also happens is the rate at which some of these behaviors transpires into the dialogue system varies. And so just going back to our example of using the Twitter data set, I'm showing you here the prevalence of hate speech and offensive language in the responses that are generated by our different models. So the VHRED model is the very complicated one I showed you earlier. HRED is a slightly simpler variant on it. All four cases here are trained with the Twitter corpus. So the initial training data is the same, but the rate at which the system produces responses that are characterized by either hate or offensive language varies quite a bit. So there is a possibility of manipulating the prevalence of some language in, um, in the data in terms of how you generate the data. Some people have argued that we can actually use these tools to enhance the level of civil discourse in some online platforms. Definitely worthwhile exploring. Um, but how you do it changes from model to model and we're not immune to changing the sense of the sentence when you do that, as well as to reducing the accuracy of our models. Let's talk a little bit about safety. Again, give you a taste of what's going on. In this case, of course, the goal is to avoid um, harmful consequences. In some of our work, we're particularly focused on uh, safety in the case where you use dialogue system in safety critical applications. If you think of the medical domain, where uh, emergency room physicians are using speech activated system to control some of the devices or in a transportation, flight, helicopter, cockpits and so on, security monitoring. There's many applications where getting the right signal is crucial uh, to having the conversation flow. And so we looked at the prevalence of an effect of adversarial examples in dialogue. Adversarial examples are actually very well studied in the machine learning community, but primarily in computer vision system. And so for those of you who are not familiar with the concept, an adversarial example is one where you take an image that is something that everyone would recognize as a panda. Um, you mix this image with just a tiny bit of random noise to get the image on the right side. And so for anyone in this room who thought that the image on the left was a panda, you probably still think that the image on the right is a panda. Panda hasn't changed from a visual point, perception point of view. And yet our classifier, through the addition of this little bit of noise, decides that this is no longer a panda, this is actually a gibbon. And so this is the notion of adversarial example. You perturb the data just a tiny little bit and you get a very different prediction from your computer system. From a safety point of view, there's a sense that people think that people can use this to manipulate data feeding into an AI system. For example, you can take a picture of yourself, slightly perturb a few pixels, and make the system think that you're somebody else. And so, um, surprisingly, a year ago, there was very, very little work on the prevalence of adversarial examples in dialogue systems. No one had really even defined the notion of a noise in a dialogue system. If you look at this, these little random pixels that we're adding to an image, it doesn't really make sense to do that in language. If I have a word, what's the meaning of adding a little random pixel to a word? 
And so we looked at different notions of adversarial example in texts. A lot of what we do as computer scientists working as researchers in this field is to actually take this notion of like safety and adversarial example and try to articulate in a precise mathematical computational way what this means. So in this case, we have this question, what is an adversarial example in text? So we came up with a few different definitions. Uh, one of them was suggested in the literature, which is to add distracting sentences to a paragraph. So you have a first paragraph. The second paragraph is exactly the same, except we've added an extra distracting sentence. So it's not that humans can't tell the difference if you read slowly enough. It's really that you won't necessarily realize that there's anything meaningfully different between the two sentences. We also looked at cases where we misspelled words, removing, replacing, inserting characters. And then we also looked at paraphrasing. So take a sentence, slightly change the wording, but in a way that doesn't change the semantic meaning. And so for all of these, we looked at what happens if you um, run your system on the example before one of these perturbations and after one of these perturbations. And here's an example of what happens. In the original case, we feed in a sentence that says, uh, as some of you might have seen the movie Inside Out, might agree with this statement, Inside Out is really funny. And the response of our dialogue system, in this case, this is trained on the Cornell Movie Database, the response of the system says, I could not stop laughing during the first one. I honestly found it to be hilarious. Case number two, adversarial, we perturbed just one letter. If you read it fast, you won't notice, but the word inside is missing an I in the middle. Inside out is really funny. And the answer that comes out of our system, I didn't really find it funny, it just surprised me, seemed like a class of expectation, which could be humorous, but it didn't hit me that way. <laughs> Completely changes the sentiment by removing one letter. Um, most of us are not immune to a little typo here and there. Um, and so if you're interacting with a dialogue system, remember to put your eyes and the dot on them. Otherwise, you will get a very different response for your system. Okay, so I'm, I'm going to wrap up and leave some time for, for questions. Really, I think one of my message today is that um, it is not a simple task to formally encode these notions whether it's the goal of the system, notions of privacy, bias, and other social norms going beyond that. There is a lot of work to do. That level of work requires quite a lot of sophistication in terms of the computational and mathematical side. But at the same time, it requires um, really a lot of input from other communities. Um, I'm certainly not adequately trained to define all the various notions of bias and privacy that might be relevant. And so this is really a question of teamwork if we're going to make progress on this. And it's impossible to make real progress on these questions without having intersectorial teams working on these questions. Um, going deeper into this, these are relatively shallow model, I would say. We're really just at some level doing pattern recognition. These systems don't yet understand intent in a really deep way. Um, and so we have a lot of work to do on the technical side in terms of incorporating personalization, knowledge, and so on. Um, but as we get more sophisticated on this side, other issues will arise on the ethical side. Um, we have a lot of work to do also really just on this question of evaluation and understanding the properties of our system. A lot of the work we do require input from humans, um, but as I was mentioning on very narrow notions of like how appropriate is this response or not. Um, in many cases, humans don't have a way to agree between each other about these notions. And so I think many of these things that we're trying to achieve in terms of uh, ethical dimension as um, a society, as a community, we don't always have clear alignment on. And as a computer scientist, that makes it very difficult. If you can give me the mathematical formulation to optimize, I can work with this. Um, but in some cases, before we get that, um, it's difficult to know what kind of systems we're building and what kind of properties they will have. And finally, um, I'm delighted to be here today, but the truth of the matter is I have a fantastic team of students and researchers who stayed in Montreal today and who are doing all of this great work. So I just want to acknowledge them. Thank you.